Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Wright, and I'm going to talk about documentation. Um, but first, let me um, tell you something about myself. Um, when, when I grew up, uh, when I was growing up, my uh, father owned a bike shop with his br brother, um, George. The, that was the Wright brothers. They had a bicycle shop. So naturally, I thought, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to invent something like the airplane. Um, but that didn't work out because I had a terrible fear of heights and public speaking. So please bear with me as we go through this talk. By the 1980s, I was living in Germany, and uh, some friends of mine were start uh, were basically had a were working on an aerospace startup, and I was working as a technical writer. So I had access to the tools, computers, and printers. And as a, a favor to them, I um, designed their logo here, which is the kind of Escher type, um, representing three Ts. If I remember correctly, it was uh, telecommunications, uh, telemetry, and technology that they were joining in this, um, in this startup. Uh, they sold that company for uh, 42 million in 2011, um, but I didn't get a penny. But, but they did give me, you know, I, I did it as a favor. I didn't mind that at all. Um, but they gave me a modem uh, when, when they, you know, when I did the job for them, and that kind of set me on the path to work in, uh, in towards the internet and all that that was involved. When that modem broke, uh, I went down to Guy and bought the V32 bis modem, if anyone remembers that. Um, and that was a fantastic upgrade. And the guy that I bought it from uh, was a internet startup in Ireland that later became the biggest ISP in Ireland. And I later got a job from that. So despite not getting a whole lot of money, uh, from the initial job, it was um, my first experience of the community and how it might benefit me in the longer term, working with people um, and getting through it. So today, um, I have a confession to make. I didn't actually write this abstract. Um, I got some help with it. Uh, and I was wondering, how, how am I going to... How am I going to present this? And I thought about this from the point of view of uh, DevOps. So with documentation, with the code, this flow, this continuous flow makes a lot of sense. And from a, a documentation point of view, we, can, we certainly plan. Instead of coding, we write. Uh, tech, you know, most times, we do build documentation sets. Uh, we test our documentation, which is very expensive from uh, a person point of view to test documentation. It's, it's very hard to automate anything. We, you know, people actually have to sit down and read the documentation in order to test it. That often falls to the end user to, to do the documentation. Instead of release and deploy, we normally call it publishing. And we publish the documentation. The, uh, the operators where we mesh with the software. So as the user is operating the software, uh, they're also reading the documentation. Um, monitoring is um, mostly uh, feedback from the user about the documentation. So it's a kind of person-to-person -person communication rather than something automated. Um, so I'm going to try to, to we're, we also have the same goals as DevOps insofar as um, we'd like to eliminate uh, repetitive tasks and reduce friction and try to automate as much as possible. I'm going to concentrate on the, the extremes here today, the, the build process on the left and the operate process on the right, which uh, in the software world is, is, are very far apart. Um, but I think with documentation, they're actually a lot closer together. 
but I wanted to have a team for this talk. And I was thinking that one of the big uh, blockers we have is uh, terminology. Terminology is uh, the b biggest sticking point with uh, documentation because people have different concepts when they see a word on, on the page, they already have a, a predetermined notion in their head about what that is. Um, so I wanted to emphasize ter terminology, terminology, terminology. And I, I wanted to do it visually, and I, I came up with, uh, with this as my diagram to represent the, the terminology. And I also got to reuse that logo. Um, another, uh, so thinking about the left-hand side of that diagram, the DevOps diagram at the beginning, we, uh, we had a build step. So traditionally, uh, with documentation, it's written in some sort of source format. In our case, it's um, ASCII doc. And then we build it in order to um, produce HTML to um, show it to the end user. Um, but uh, this little project here is where uh, I'm using ASCII Dr. JS to, uh, re to remove that um, build step. So instead of um, building the documentation, you can just uh, throw documentation into a repo and the uh, GitHub pages will automatically publish it. So just a hands up, uh, how many people know what ASCII doc is? Is it familiar to everybody in the room? Well, maybe not half of the people. Um, I just introduced it as being um, marked. It's very similar to Markdown, uh, except it fixes some of the problems associated with Markdown. Um, you don't have to edit any HTML in order to produce a, a site with, uh, with this tool. Um, you just throw your markup files at the uh, repo and it, uh, it renders them. It uses Patternfly in order to, um, to actually render the HTML um, and that gives us uh, some advantages uh, that you, you get a responsive design and um, this whole process means that you're really only using uh, Git as the content management system. So in traditional content management systems, there's all sorts of uh, processes there um, with this that gets pushed, that problem gets pushed to Git and people have to be familiar with that, but once they are familiar with it, then it, uh, it, 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 makes it, it makes the rendering, the publication side of it um, much easier. So back to the original, oops, the original problem. So in Agile, um, we're trying to continuously push things out and that, uh, that involves the build system. We've already automated the, um, the build. We've taken out the build step by throwing ASCII doc directly at the um, ASCII doctor.js. Then it renders the HTML. And that allows us to uh, use that same JavaScript in order to um, automate testing uh, for syntax and for structure, and we're using Git for version control. The, one of the questions um, that I had for somebody one time, because I kind of think as of um, Git, the number I think of when I uh, think of GitHub uh, is uh, the 100 million repos on GitHub that represents the huge amount of um, usage of GitHub. It's the most common used system for, for software control, for version control. 
Um, but s somebody said to me they think of GitHub and, and Git in general, and they think of the number nine, which uh, and I was wondering, how did you get nine from that? Well, they said there's, um, in Git, when you're working in Git, you've got the working tree, um, you've got the index tree, and you have the head tree, and three trees is nine. So I don't know whether that makes any sense, but I'm going to keep going. The next question, after we've pushed the ASCII doc and displayed it to the user uh, in the browser is, could we possibly uh, add some more to that? You know, what if the browser knew about your environment? So if you're logged into an application such as the OpenShift console, uh, then obviously the browser has a certain knowledge about the configuration of your application. Uh, and the next step is to uh, use an, an API and uh, inspect the environment and include that in, in your documentation. So as we were working on this particular project, um, uh, th this is a link to the web app, which uh, basically runs alongside the OpenShift console um, in its own namespace. Um, but it allows the, us to render uh, the documentation within the context of OpenShift and thereby resolve uh, a lot of um, questions that the user might have. So the user might be looking for the URL for a particular service that's already running in OpenShift. And with, um, with this particular web app, um, that means the documentation automatically knows about the routes to the various applications and presents them in line in the documentation. So when you click on the AMQ online link, then it, it brings you directly to that application. The other thing it can do is it can um, resolve certain um, environment variables in the environment, so if the document, if Normally in the documentation, we would sort of say maybe drop to the command line and find out the value for a particular environment variable. Uh, but with, because we're rendering on the fly, we can inject that value into the documentation while allowing the technical writer to remain writing in the style in which they're accustomed. So it doesn't require any programming skills or any extra skills involved for the technical writer to be able to reference uh, um, environment variables, CRDs, uh, routes, et cetera. Uh, we, they were, the uh, UXD team, um, Red Hat UXD team, also were able to add some logic to the, uh, to the application so that we could uh, ask the user if they have been able to succeed in their task. And if they haven't succeeded in their task, then they're able to, uh, we're able to present more information to the user. So this reduces a, a procedure from being uh, a complex thing for the end user to complete and um, reduce it down into a nice experience. And all of the uh, code examples are rendered in such a way as they can uh, copy those from the browser uh, if they need them in another context, for instance, another application or, or on the command line. So how, how do we actually achieve this? So on the right-hand side, um, I've got some ASCII doc, it looks very similar to Markdown. Um, it just has a slightly different syntax. Uh, the uh, unit of work in this, uh, uh, in this application is a walkthrough. 
Um, this is a walkthrough called Doing Stuff. Uh, you create a, a NASCII doc file. Uh, you put in a, a level one heading to describe the walkthrough. A level two uh, describes any particular tasks. And if you want to, to break it down even further, you can create subtasks. And these, uh, you push those to a GitHub, uh, to a repo on, in GitHub, GitLab, whatever. Uh, and then the application renders uh, a home page which shows all of the uh, walkthroughs. And then you can read the introduction. You can uh, you know, navigate the tasks. And then there are also the, uh, those questions that I showed you earlier there, uh, known as verifications. And then there are uh, links that appear on the right-hand side which are either walkthrough resources that are global to the walkthrough or task resources that are only um, useful in the context of a particular task. So the, the Red Hat UXD team uh, were heavily involved in, in working with this, going back to the agile um, aspect of this whole talk. They, um, it wasn't just uh, the engineering team or documentation. Uh, we're also uh, working closely with the UX team, UXD team. And they are actually uh, in the venue today. I'm going to look it up. Uh, they're in the C building by the docks, whatever that means. I'm not sure. Uh, somebody just sent me a message. I put a call out because uh, they moved from where they were yesterday. Um, and they are actually interested, if anybody has the time and the interest uh, to, if you could drop by there and sign up because they want to know more. They're testing alternative approaches for, you know, what happens when we have dozens and dozens of walkthroughs. We already have maybe 20 walkthroughs uh, there in, in this application. And how would a user navigate all of these different walkthroughs. Uh, how should we display uh, metadata on that page? So every walkthrough is associated with certain services uh, how, and comes from a particular Git repo. How do we display that? And, and they're also uh, very interested in the overall usability of, the, of this system. Okay, now I'm going to take my life into my hands and um, show you what it would actually look like if I can find the page. So this is the, uh, the web application that I mentioned. There are um, a whole set of walkthroughs here. Um, Actually, I'm going to switch to this one because it's looking good. Uh, in the, oops. Oh, yeah. I need to, how do I do that? I pull it over here, is it? Yeah. Okay. So I can maximize that. So uh, there, there are various walkthroughs uh, here. Um, but I have um, just created this new walkthrough. Uh, it's a very simple walkthrough, um, and it has one extra component that I haven't mentioned earlier, which is that uh, there's a walkthrough ASCII.file, uh, but beside the walkthrough ASCII.file, you can have a JSON file, and in that JSON file, you can uh, provision new services. Uh, in this case, um, I want to basically provision a, uh, a PHP MySQL application. When the user uh, use, you know, reads the introduction um, and clicks Getting Started, it actually, in the background, OpenShift provisions that service. Uh, now, we, you know, as part of the task, we're going to task, which is in the next stage, 
we're going to ask the user to, um, to basically run the application and click on the URL. But the URL isn't available at this point because the, the, uh, the service hasn't been provisioned. So um, you might see, just as this gets rendered, you will see the ASCII Docker attribute that, um, that is in the ASCII Docker code. Um, and then as the service is provisioned, you'll see the resolving to the URL. Oh, it just resolved. We didn't get to see it. But that's, a, that's a bit unfortunate, but um, I can show you the source code for that particular task, and that might uh, kind of give you an idea of what is going on. Why have I got three screens all of a sudden? Um, no. Okay, you're just going to have to trust me on that one. That the uh, when you um, when you write the the code, you don't know the URL for the uh, the application. Um, but you can just put in an ASCII doc attribute, and when the service is provisioned, it uh, resolves to this URL. And just to confirm that that actually doesn't work, which is uh, uh, which is disappointing. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, now that that time it, it, you actually saw the attribute there for a second. And when we click in, it still doesn't work. Okay, well, it's not really the, the point of it anyway, so. Uh, one last go. No. Okay, that's, this is why I don't do talks. And I'd also love to know why I am not able to share the code Okay, move on is what they say. Okay, so uh, so these this is um, what what happened as part of that process. Then, as the team worked on this, was that we discovered that we're not going to be the only people who want to write these walkthroughs. That the community in the larger community. Um, would also want to contribute to and, and be able to publish their own walkthroughs and, and our tutorials. And so we found that we were uh, suddenly writing um, walkthroughs about how to write walkthroughs, how to find walkthroughs, how to uh, basically um, increase the number of walkthroughs that are available. Uh, to the to the community as, as larger. At the moment, the web app is very specific for a, a, a particular purpose, um, but I, I hope that we could remove some of the uh, specific parts out of the web app and be able to make it more generally available to, for anybody who's running OpenShift. Um, that, um, and it could be used and uh, then for general OpenShift documentation, our documentation which is uh, specific to uh, an OpenShift use case that, um, that we haven't anticipated. Uh, and the other uh, question that um, I, I haven't resolved in my own head, um, but um, I'm kind of investigating, is how we could take this technique and pull it out of OpenShift and use it in the context of uh, perhaps Fedora. Like, how uh, would this look in, in Cockpit? 
as a, as a way of um, mingling the documentation and the actual application together in, in a single task um, that, uh, that whereby we could have a more, going back to the DevOps approach, where uh, we can basically push documentation to the user as quickly as possible, uh, remove the notion of building a documentation set and publishing it, but rather integrating it into the, uh, into the environment in which the user is operating, and giving them the information that they need, and also being able to query the environment and give them the information without having to write a big procedure about how they have to um, perform certain tasks in order to get a value which they're then going to paste into some other location and some other application. Okay, I think I'll just pause there and ask for if anybody has any questions because uh, I'd love to be able to figure out how I did this. But if anybody has any questions, now is a good time. No. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go back to the uh, to the code again, and this is the code. This is the ASCII doc for the, uh, the very simple walkthrough that we looked at there. It only has one step, um, and it's navigate to the URL. Uh, this is the URL that we, uh, to the PHP app, and uh, it's related to the um, JSON file insofar as the JSON file uh, calls for this service to be uh, to be provisioned, and then uh, we're able to derive an ASCII doc attribute from that service name in order to be able to show it to the user. So uh, it's quite simple for a technical writer to kind of look at the JSON file, pull out that value, add route, you know, prepend it with route and append it with host, and now they have the ASCII doc attribute name that can be used for the route. And that same technique can be used for other variables and other resources that are uh, in the OpenShift environment. Um, if we wanted to add a uh, some walkthrough resources to that uh, particular uh, walkthrough, then we can just uh, add them in here. Um, so this is all standard ASCII doc, uh, any ASCII doc processor, and I'm thinking of uh, Antora or, um, or other systems, similar systems, uh, they will just ignore these, um, these this annotation that we're using, and it will um, it will just um, appear as a uh, as a, you know basically uh, exactly as if it was in the preview here. If I open the preview, I can show you that um, it just basically creates a block uh, with a link there. But if we push that into a, an actual environment, which I'm going to do here, and I'm just going to restart this app. Then when we look at the walkthrough, then we see that walkthrough resources have been added and the links appear on the right-hand side. So there are uh, other annotations that you can put into the ASCII doc to, uh, to, to perform different functions. Um, the, uh, for example, the amount of time that it takes to perform each task 
and, and then that gets aggregated up to the task, the amount of time that it would take to complete the, the whole walkthrough. Okay, uh, if there are, if anybody has any interest in this, uh, please contact me and uh, I can show you more of the, the actual annotations and, the, um, and how they add certain functionality, um, especially the verifications, uh, and then there are also task resources, which is way of linking off to, to further detailed documentation. Um, but I am going to call it at that. Um, anybody have any questions? Yeah, two. This is awesome. Um, I'd like to claim I, uh, uh, one uh, disclaimer here. I introduced it as like the cyclist, as if the cyclist came first. But the cyclist came as a an idea after the web app was developed with, uh, and a lot of the, the web app wasn't me, it was uh, UXD and uh, engineering from the Waterford of Red Hat office. Uh, with, uh, with deploying automatically, you know, going quick time to get deploying, is that deploying straight out to the production sites? And I'm just wondering about like the uh, uh, quality Right, so, uh, and that's related. At the moment, we're not rendering any metadata at the moment, but the most critical part of the metadata is there are two types of uh, water. There are official published, you know, core waters, and then there's your stuff, if you know what I mean. So you can customize it all you want. Um, in OpenShift, um, the, in order to add something to your, uh, you know, in order to publish a walkthrough, then all you have to do is edit this walkthrough locations here and add a Git reference to a, to a repo. So, um, so people will be able to put in into their cluster now, into their own cluster, they'll be able to put in uh, their own walkthroughs that may not have been fully tested. Um, you know, by us, basically. So, uh, but as long as we label them correctly so that when you're starting a walkthrough that you realize this is a tested, fully, you know, supported walkthrough as distinct from this is uh, Jimmy's walkthrough that he wrote on the bus on, on the way home or whatever. And then, I, you know, I think that's fine. I was going to ask, can you talk a little bit about the interactions with the development team? So there's a new app coming down the road. Instead of waiting for you to get it thrown over the fence, when do you come in? Because clearly you can come in a hell of a lot earlier here from, you know, when the ideas app are coming about. So could you talk maybe a little bit about that? Um, yes, I can. Uh, um, yeah, so I suppose the whole point of all this has to think from the traditional um, the traditional tech writer experience is you, you you, you, you're given a project and you, they say to you, you know, you have to document this and then you go down to the developer and they say it's not ready yet. And you go back a week later and it's not ready to be consumed yet. Um, <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, they sort of say, well, there you go. It's all working now. You're good to document it. Oh, and by the way, we're releasing next week. So uh, that, that's the uh, traditional approach. Um, as each of these these walkthroughs involve um, multiple complex moving parts that are changing, you know, it, it, typically a walkthrough would involve three different products, and those products, are, new versions of those products, are being uh, released at the same time. Um, so, we, with this system, we can get a first draft out really quickly. You know, there's, you know, just it's just push it into Git, and hey presto, we're we're up and running. Now we can, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most expensive 
parts of the documentation process is testing. So we can get that in front of as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And, uh, and we're working with engineering instead of against engineering uh, in that process. Uh, and we're getting feedback from UXD as well. So it's, it's a much more uh, inclusive process rather than uh, a, uh, a segmented process, which was the old way of doing things. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going. To, everybody gets to get, have a cup of tea early. Thanks, everyone.